Hello, and welcome to episode four of Rainbow Devil Cast. I'm your host, Savannah Grace. Throughout the podcast, which is an output of Duke's Center for Sexual and Gender Diversity, we'll be talking to folks in the center and around campus doing great work to further the body of knowledge and justice. I want to open this episode with an acknowledgement of recent events and a validation of whatever folks may be feeling in the wake of the presidential election, whether that be anger, numbness, sadness, exhaustion, fear, or anything else. I also want to offer some words that my mother sent me on election night that felt restorative for me, especially during those couple hours. There's a concept in behavioral therapy known as extinction burst. Basically, when you're trying to remove a behavior, often you will actually see an increase in that behavior before it dies. The old world order is screaming right now. What we are seeing tonight are the death throes of a system that cannot last. Whatever the outcome, remember that what happens at the federal level is not the end of the story. We can take charge in our communities and we can continue to move in the right direction. Let them scream. The rest of us have work to do. The sun will come up tomorrow. And it did. My guest today met with me before the election results, so you'll hear her thoughts in the days leading up to it. At the end of the show, she gives us some of what's on her mind now. Jules Odendahl James must be a superwoman to do everything that she does. In addition to being the Director of Academic Engagement for the Humanities in the Academic Advising Center at Duke, she teaches classes in theater studies and serves as the dramaturg for theater studies shows. She also works with tons of local companies, whether as director or dramaturg. On top of all of that, you'll hear her talk about her partner and daughter. You'll also hear her mention a few names that might be unfamiliar, such as Kate Bornstein and Leslie Feinberg. Both of these individuals are transgender writers and activists who made their mark with works such as Bornstein's Gender Outlaw and Feinberg's Stone Butch Blues. I also want to offer a brief content warning for a brief, non-graphic mention of sexual assault that occurs when Jules is talking about the play she intends on directing at Meredith College. Can you offer me like a brief history of your work, specifically around sexuality, gender, and identity? So I think I would probably locate that in my first work in graduate school, getting my MFA in directing at the University of Texas at Austin, and uh, discovering feminist theory at the time, and being very interested in feminist interventions in the canon, Um, and doing that in performance through exploring cross-gender casting, because I was working with a department, and it's an industry that is majority women, and yet the roles are few um, for women specifically. And so I did a a cross-gender Good Person of Sichuan, which is a Brecht play, and a Cyrano de Bergerac, which was um, sort of around the time that I was also coming out. And so those two things sort of um, dovetailed. But I also was particularly focused on, you know, gender as a performance and what did that mean? And this is way back um, when that theory is just being written and sort of argued and discovering Judith Butler and what did that mean for performance and then also what did that mean for everyday life Um, and as someone who doesn't uh, present in a non-gender sort of uh, expected sort of cisgender presentation um, I didn't necessarily have to deal with the same kind of visibility issues and relationships but I was also intrigued with that too about what is the space of the feminine um, in a construct of gender continuum and then for my MFA thesis I chose to do the first production that hadn't been done originally of Kate Bornstein's Hidden Agenda which was a play that Kate wrote as part of Gender Outlaw Um, And I felt like I was sort of both exploring a really brand new terrain, but it was also giving me a different way to think about gender performance when you were also sort of living um, offstage what trans identity was at the time and how it was starting to articulate itself. So she was very generous with me. Um, She and Justin Bond, who was in the original performance of that, came to see the show in Austin. And I got to meet Sandy Stone, who was a theorist there, and um, I didn't ever met, but did a lot of reading of Leslie Feinberg. So I feel like I sort of had a, a real connection with the trans community early in my career to think about how intersectionality worked within queer circles um, and the difference between gender and sexuality and performance. Um, 
I worked with a trans actor at that time as well, someone who was just about 21, had never been an actor before, and was very much negotiating gender identity, deciding whether to um, pursue surgically or to live in a space that I think we're much more comfortable with now. And this was at a time, it's never not a risky time, but at a time where that was really um, dangerous. And the, the queer community had sort of embraced theater in Austin gays and lesbians, but the trans community, like this was the time where people were coming to the theater, it was a whole sort of like, wow, you're doing a show, that's a show that's about me, you know, or about parts of my life. And so that felt really, um, cemented my notion that art in and of itself can be activist, activist work, and then it also needs to be curated and cultivated where that's concerned. And so what is your responsibility in terms of what you choose? Um, how you engage the people that you want to come and see it, and um, what sort of complexity do you offer an audience that's brand new to this sort of thing. So again, I always think of these things as really the foundations of what have become the way that I work now. And then I did my dissertation work uh, trying to extend that idea of really thinking about the feminine and how the feminine is a double-edged sword for women. And my dissertation was exploring this notion of the post-feminine, which was not post-feminist, which doesn't really exist, but also post-feminine in that space where women are both held to a standard of expected feminine behavior that also then becomes the thing that you can never measure up to or that's also disruptive. And what did that mean for the lives of very particular women in my dissertation looked at? Um, the figure of the criminal woman, the trans man, and sort of that space of identity, and the elderly woman as sort of figures of you're both in and outside of femininity and how those were being negotiated. Um, so it's been a long sort of track of really thinking of those things as intertwined. At a point in time, too, where I find I don't teach necessarily classes that are on gender, but those things are always at the centerpiece of what I choose to teach in my reg regular classes. Um, so we're always reading um, particularly work by queer theorists, by feminist performance, uh, both artists and critics. Um, just is sort of part of the terrain that if you're going to study with me, that's the baseline instead of here's the baseline and the stuff we're introducing as sort of special topic. So um, I have a balance of a job that uh, has me working with students in the context of academic planning. Um, I also teach and I also have an active artistic community and career and I have a family. <laughs> So that means a typical day is I'm getting up and getting my family ready. Um, then I'm coming to work at a particular sort of traditional time. And within that day on campus, I'm either teaching or I'm meeting with students um, or I'm, you know, uh, trying to interface with other faculty. And it, in the evenings, I'm picking up my, you know, certainly my daughter and then getting that sort of set. And oftentimes then I will be going to rehearsal. And then I come home at the end of the day, um, sort of when uh, everybody else is in bed and do a little more work and then I go to sleep. So that probably feels very familiar. Although I've sent notes to actors when I've been directing at Duke and I'm sending them at like one o'clock in the morning and I get a response back and I'm like, you should be asleep. And the students are like, wait, I'm awake. This is when I'm doing my homework. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense actually. That feels very similar <laughs> to how I probably should not be conducting my life, but sort of how I do. I've had a colleague ask me if I sleep, and I do. I actually feel that I am fairly generous with myself uh, within that, but I also try to be really efficient with my time, which I also think is a shared experience of Duke students is feeling like I can do a lot if I keep it all ordered. Yeah. So. Great. Um, so what's something you're excited about that's coming up in your life, academically or personally? Um, well, so this year I'm actually a keenly scholar in medical humanities affiliated with the Penn State College of Medicine um, with some of the work I've been doing over the past few years in medical humanities. So when I have time to breathe, and I was teaching a class in the spring focused on that, um, that's really exciting. I've had two experiences over the summer and this early part of the year with other faculty, both at Duke, but also around the country that are working in this interest section between theater and medicine um, specifically, but also broadly humanities and um, healthcare. 
So that's really exciting to be preparing that class for the spring, which will also be working with a colleague at Davidson in her class. So I like collaboration as a theater artist. I do it. I like it as a teacher as well. Um, And the students in the class are going to be adapting a graphic novel for performance, which, you know, take a thump on home as being, that's way beyond what we will do, but a sort of aspiration, um, with a colleague who's, who, it's her book, and it's going to be just out in March, and so we're going to have access to her and to the text and to do sort of what what will this look like and what it will be like. So, um, And then I have two shows I'm directing in the spring um, at Man Bites Dog, which is a, a story about an interracial couple, and it follows their relationship from when they meet in 1985 to ni- uh, 2031, um, uh, two women, And then at Meredith, I'm going to be a guest director at Meredith College in Raleigh and directing a feminist slasher play called Hookman by um, Lauren Yee, who's an emerging, I think she already emerged, um, Asian-American playwright that we've done a couple of her shows here at Duke, um, but sort of follows a college student and how she deals with being in college um, and potentially having experienced sexual assault and also being responsible for the death of her friend in a car accident and sort of like ghosts and haunting um, relationship to that. So I'm really excited about that. I'm very apprehensive about the election. (laughs) Um, I would have said the Cubs until last night, so I don't have to be apprehensive about that, although it was a very late night, being very apprehensive. And I think I posted on Facebook that I'm out of heart attacks. I need to have some for next week. yeah, I'm very concerned, and um, mostly just because I think there's a lot at stake locally, and I've seen a lot, I've lived in North Carolina for almost 15 years now, um, so it's come to feel like home, and I've seen a lot of change and transition, both very positively, but also extremely negative in the last four years, and um Having a kid within that also makes me really, you know, apprehensive about what um, what will happen for her um, and for my family if an, an administration comes in where it seems that, despite some reassurances by people I don't quite trust, that everything will be just fine, uh, I actually think that it won't be. Um, and I would hate to see very sort of hard-fought progress go back for both older people and for definitely younger people because I think that being able to see people come out and feel safer at younger and younger ages and all the things that that is forcing society to deal with in terms of gender and in terms of um, identity and sexuality especially for young kids um, I would hate to see that all sort of pushed back into a place that would not we're already struggling (laughs) with how to make that well and healthy Um, I don't want to see that go back As with previous guests, Jules shared with me a few of her practices and rituals surrounding self-care in the world of activists and theater work. For me, I draw comfort in being organized and sort of laying things out um, for like a weekly schedule. Um, But I also try not to be too hard on myself if things don't go to plan. Parenting is a great uh, space where you learn exactly what you plan and what happens is being very different things. I do think having, uh, trying to keep my child in a space of self-care also makes sure that I am that way. So we try to make sure that we all eat together in, at the morning and in the evening times if we can at all manage it. Um, even though I'm gone to rehearsal or not, but always trying to find that space of some place where we're all sitting in the space together no devices that we're just kind of talking with each other, striving for that as much as possible, um, cutting myself off from social media as much as I find it a space of connection, um, particularly at moments where um, conversations just seem to be sort of spiraling into things that are not helpful, um, getting enough sleep, uh, I think, and surrounding myself with people that... Um, are challenging, right? So that they're not just in a small bubble, but also that uh, people that I feel like I can go to if I need support. I've had, my spouse has had some serious health issues over the past 10 years, but they've been fairly dire off and on for the last two years. 
And so really knowing that I have to ask for help and not feeling that that's a failure on my part in order to do that and to let people find a way to help. Um, being type A, I like to do a lot of things on my own, um, but really um, stepping back from that and letting other people in, even when that means I'm, that makes me vulnerable, which is a place that I, you know, sort of negotiate. Um, and that's helped me sort of realize what I need to let go of and what to prioritize what's fundamentally what's really important. Um, and also to, to not feel defeated by when things don't go well. Um, as much as I want to, you know, I'm very good at giving advice and think about how that I need to take that advice when it comes to that kind of thing and how much my friends can be called upon to um, really just take some kind of load off of me, which I think means I have to kind of humble myself in the face of their generosity. And that's hard to do. Um, but it's necessary because there's no way to do it all. If I believe in collaboration with in theater, I have to believe in collaboration for self-care because I need a village to do that as well. As promised, I asked Jules to record a voice memo in the wake of the election results. Content warning here for brief mentions of death, systematic violence, and the AIDS crisis. So in my initial conversation, I was asked what I was anxious about, and I mentioned the election. And I mentioned that my anxiety had to do with the fact that I didn't want to see things turn back, that we had gone a long way in the past eight years and really the past 25 years in terms of equal rights, greater equity, certainly not perfect, but better. And so I sit a week later after the results of the election, and I'm trying to figure out a way to remember the past is a roadmap. Uh, the first legal document I made in the mid-90s was a will, and I made it because I had met the person who would later become my wife, but at the time had no such standing, no promise of such standing ever. And we were in graduate school and there were a series of really unexpected deaths that happened amongst our classmates and uh, a couple of the faculty. And it sent a real shiver through the community of, of students and um, colleagues. And so it seemed wise, it seemed like the right thing to do, but the more we thought about it, the kind of irony of it was that we had enough standing as citizens to make something like a will, which already imagined us as, as not being living, right? As the way that we asserted our citizenship was to think about our deaths. And that can be very morbid of a thought, um, but at the same time, this is, not long after the real height of the AIDS crisis, this was maybe three years after Tony Kushner wrote Angels in America, and that was a very provocative claim and public stance on visibility for queer men and women. And as much as it angered me and frustrated me to only think of myself as a citizen under threat, it also made me fairly clear about what conscious choices I would have to make to move through the world. And like many things, I think it shaped the activism that I have hoped to have modeled for myself and to check myself in my modeling of that, even when times seem much better. And so... I would say that my apprehension is sadly come to roost, um, but I also feel always and continually conscious that we can always be better there is always more equity 
to be crafted and considered and that the comfort of privilege always is at someone else's expense and always better to be thinking about how what I get can be shared and how my position Let me try to think of a better way to say that. I guess I'm trying to think of the more recent saying that um, y'all means all. Um, And that sometimes security and comfort allow us to grow complacent. There will be no time for complacency in the days ahead, the years ahead, and we owe it to ourselves and to the people that we care about and the people that we don't know personally, but whose lives, our lives touch by either what we struggle against or what we are able to achieve and be secure in, and that while I do not wish this to come with harm and hurt, there is something to be forged in struggle that can make us ultimately better and sharper and more equitable, even if we might be facing times where that what has been so keenly struggled for seems to be slipping away. We have pathways, we have warriors, we have people who have gone before and struggled for us, and we will struggle for people in our wake as well. And even in my anxiety about that, I am hopeful that we will learn how to do it, and we will prevail. There's uh, the last couple of lines or towards the end of Angels in America, and it's been often quoted in the wake of this election, but you know, Prior Walter makes a stance about there's lots of, there, the ravages of AIDS are, it will take many people from it, us, but we will not be unseen anymore. And um, it says, we won't die secret deaths anymore. The world only spins forward. We will be citizens. The time has come. There's many more people in need of that embrace of citizenship now than in 1993 when he wrote this. And I hope that we as a queer community can figure out how to build coalition and be models for um, our own understandings of equity and inclusion and parity, and empathy. Um, That's what I hope. This episode of Rainbow Doublecast was produced and edited by Savannah Grace. Special thanks to my guest, Jules Odendahl-James. Ultimate love to everyone out there, and thanks to my team, Angel Colley, Sky Wilson, Nick Antonici, Mita Connor, Melly Bonanno, Minerva Bonanno, Janelle Taylor, Ivan Robles, Michael Bledgy, Quinn Baker, and Wandy Che. Our theme song is Two Hearted River by Snake Oil Salesman. Other music for this episode was by Ben Sound, VA Nectar, and Kai Angle. Get new episodes of the podcast by subscribing to the CSGD YouTube channel or SoundCloud, or by liking the Center for Sexual and Gender Diversity on Facebook. You can find out more information about the Center and the podcast at studentaffairs.duke.edu slash CSGD. Also, there's going to be a special bonus episode on Monday, November 21st, in honor of Trans Day of Remembrance and Resilience, so keep an eye out for that. See you soon. Peace and love. Hook oh, man. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. I love it. I yeah, love I have it. to figure out how to make people spontaneously bleed on stage and how to take someone's face off. Mm. Well, <laughs> as someone who just closed Sweeney Todd... I was just going to say... <laughs> You've got some blood tips for you. Hey, good. Especially how to wash it out of costume. Yeah. Because that was my job. Oh, no. Yes, yes. <laughs>